There. Not too loud. All right. Um, good afternoon. My name is uh, Joshua Broder, and I'm the CEO of Tilson, and I'll be your moderator uh, for hopefully a, a spirited uh, discussion on 5G. I normally um, find myself in a unconflicted position uh, when talking about broadband. Um, in my in my uh, business, I, I have two two hats um, that have never been in conflict before until recently. One is in advising uh, states and other agencies on infrastructure deployment, particularly around broadband, um, and the other is in helping carriers develop next generation networks, and in particular, emerging 5G uh, and what I'll describe as 4.5G uh, dense networks. And in um, today's discussion, um, I think you'll hear some of the challenges inherent in um, those uh, that look to advocate for uh, community broadband and also uh, challenges around deploying um, dense uh, four and a half and 5G networks, and in particular, small cells. So I find myself in an unusual place um, to have sympathies for two sides of an issue, um, and the issue is in deploying broadband infrastructure. And so I understand this morning uh, there was some discussion about rights of way, and one of the things I hope we'll do today is uh, get a little bit of a better understanding about uh, what 5G is. I think one of the complicated parts of having conversations about deployment priorities and regulation is in fundamentally understanding what something is that, that we don't have. I'll, I'll take a quick straw poll. Does anybody have a 5G device on them today? <laughs> John from ATT, I thought he might have like a pilot in his pocket and uh, sort of encourage him to leave it behind so we can take a look. But um, so one of the fundamental challenges is something we haven't seen yet. And so um, I think there's, um, not necessarily a, a common set of facts and understanding uh, between different uh, people in this space. Um, and the other is a lot of curiosity about uh, what, what might be coming down the pike. So joining me today uh, is John Emra. He's the state president of uh, AT&T here in Connecticut. Um, I think John's been at AT&T uh, since 2001 um, and perhaps engaged in the industry for quite a bit longer uh, than that as an advisor. Um, to telecom companies, and one of the things that struck me about 2001 uh, is that in 2001, I was implementing 16 kilobit field phones uh, for the federal government and the military. And so, what a what a what a, uh, a distance we've come in this short time to be talking about gigabit speeds uh, over wireless. So, uh, a lot in, in your time at AT&T, John. Lot, yeah. <laughs> uh, Joanne Hovis is here from CTC Technology. She's the president there. Um, in addition to being a former uh, NATOA president, um, she's been in the trenches, I think, advising a lot of communities on uh, some of these emerging small cell issues, and in particular, as we talk about lots more small cells uh, for 5G. Uh, Angela Stacy is here. She's the VP of Marketing and Communications for SmartWorks. Um, I, believe she has a strong history consulting for carriers, and in particular, Verizon and Sprint. Is that true? Um, and uh, notably serves on the BDAC, uh, the Broadband Deployment and Advisory Committee of the FCC, uh, which has been wrestling in particular with issues of how to accelerate infrastructure in the rights of way. And so before we delve into the questions, I may just briefly um, chime in with some two cents about uh, what 5G might be at the very highest level, just so we um, start having a common vocabulary for our conversation, and then I'm, I'm excited to hear um, what, what the committee can tell us about what this means to their uh, clients and customers. And in particular, um, I want to call out that 5G is a collection of technology and approaches, and depending on who you ask, you get a different answer. And so mm -hmm. from a technology standpoint, um, we know that 5G includes things like using very high frequencies um, that haven't been used before in wireless for delivering broadband uh, that are generally short range and very high capacity. Um, we know that it includes things like beam forming antennas, very large antennas that can deliver um, spectrum very efficiently to users just when they need it. Uh, we know that it's supposed to be high capacity uh, meaning it can carry a lot of data and very low latency, so it can do it in ways that um, have a very 
small delay between a transmission leaving and being received. Um, and we also know that it's highly dependent on fiber optic cabling. So we talk about 5G as a wireless technology, but one of the really striking things about 5G is that the majority of the capital dollars going into rolling out 5G is in the dense, what I describe as front hall uh, fiber networks that support connecting lots of little uh, wireless devices back to a place um, where uh, data and applications happen. Um, generally, when we talk about small cells um, today, uh, but not for very much longer, we're mostly talking about what I'll use a, a layperson's term and say four and a half G, and four and a half G would be um, the things we use to densify our current 4G mobility networks. And when 4G was rolled out, it was primarily uh, in place to serve mobile customers, but increasingly as it's matured, it served fixed customers as well. And as carriers started providing some unlimited services plans, one of the things that really struck us in the field was that in rural areas, networks that had a lot of capacity all of a sudden became quite congested as people repurposed those mobile networks to serve essentially fixed applications. Um, 4.5G is primarily a small cell game. Um, and so whether we're talking about a pizza box or a refrigerator, we're talking about some equipment out on a pole, um, that's much closer to where um, users of mobile service are. And so this allows us to use frequency more efficiently um, and also to unburden some of the large tower sites that have become a bit congested by taking local users off of those sites, which give those local users a great experience and also help other people within sight of those large sites um, have, a, have less contended resources. Um, I think the other thing that's true of both 4.5 and, and 5G is that primarily they're privately funded. And in that private funding lays some of the roots of uh, some of the controversies around uh, the siting of those facilities, which we'll, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about today. So um, with that, I'd like to uh, engage the panel here and start to hear a little bit about um, what 5G means to them, and, and since uh, AT&T is here in person, uh, it'd be great maybe to start there with John and, and hear a little bit about what 5G uh, means to AT&T. Sure. Thanks, Josh. I think um, if I can start, maybe just talk about sort of what's driving it. Um, you know, if you look at um, usage on our wireless networks um, over the last 10 years, um, we've seen usage increase 360,000 percent in the last decade. And what's driving that really is our customers, right? And everybody who has a smartphone, I see some people streaming live video in here right now. And, you know, as we look as, as what's the future like, as consumers continue to consume more video and then create their own video and post that video, we just see the usage rates increasing, increasing, increasing. So um, the reason why we're, you know, we've moved to a small cell world and, and eventually to a 5G world is really to meet that customer demand. And um, we, we frankly don't make these huge investments because it's something we necessarily want to do, but it's something that our customers expect us to do. So I think that's important. And then when you talk about kind of what is, you know, what does the 5G world look like? And I think you're right, there's a lot of hype that's out there um, right now with different carriers claiming all sorts of different things. Um, you know, we are started a very small scale deployment. I would consider it a small scale deployment of 5G in about 12 different communities, uh, parts of 12 different communities across the country. Verizon has, um, has started a small deployment of 5G as well. Um, in, in a number of communities, uh, particularly out west. So you start to see that come on, but I, I think you're right, Josh. I think sort of terminating, you know, the term four, four and a half G is probably a good one um, because we're still waiting for a lot of the standards to come out. Um, you mentioned about handsets and, um, and who, who has a 5G handset. Nobody does. Um, you know, those handsets are some, some time away. We expect to see some of them at the end of 2019. Um, really, the bulk of them in 2020, if you read, believe some of the reports that are out there, the first iPhone will be in 2020. Um, but so, so for AT&T's perspective today, it is um, a, a Wi-Fi puck that's 5G capable that we're, that we're out there deploying today. And from a customer perspective, you know, what does it really mean? Yeah, it's you know, much faster speeds than what you have today, but don't just think of it as kind of the next iteration of you know, from 3G to 4G, because it's not just a speed play. 
Um, it certainly have, you know, enables speeds of gigabit, in some cases higher, um, and that's important, but the latency is probably, I would argue, more important and particularly more important for applications like things, things like smart cities. So you go from a 30, second millis 30 millisecond latency today on a typical network that's operating well um, in a 5G world, that's down to about one millisecond. Um, and that enables things like autonomous vehicles, smart city nodes, um, and, and also, frankly, where you can have just about anything to be part and parcel of the Internet of Things. So you're collecting, collecting and using all of that kind of data to, to provide all, a, a whole host of services. So that's how we see the 5G world. And, and you know, really, this is something that's fundamentally being driven by our customers. Great. Uh, thanks, John. You mentioned the uh, deployment um, by AT&T of a puck uh, that supports mm -hmm. 5G. And when I think about a puck, I think about while that puck may be mobile, you're you're typically not moving when you're using it. So sitting there, um, yeah. And so this is a fixed application in a way, uh, semi-mobile. Uh, and I know that Verizon similarly has deployed a, a 5G device uh, for in-home or in-business use, um, which can also support a very fast uh, wireless connection. And so this to me sounds like a fixed first application, which is just the opposite of what we saw in 4G, which was a mobile first. And so my, my next question is for Joanne. Um, it, it'd be interesting to, to get your perspective on, you know, given the potential for 5G networks to provide um, potentially a competitive service for some fixed broadband, why there isn't better information for consumers, jurisdictions, and regulators generally know about 5G. It feels like there's still uh, a lot of lack, lack of clarity about what the capabilities of the systems are. Um, yes, and that's part of the reason why I actually our discussion so far has been incredibly refreshing because it's you know, very frank and pragmatic. Unfortunately, I think the term 5G has taken on a life of its own beyond what was ever anticipated, certainly by the standards writing bodies that are writing standards for what will be the new 5G technologies, not yet finalized, by the way. So by definition, it doesn't exist yet because the standards don't exist, and that is what gives life to those names. But the name has become associated with so many other things, and we're frankly at the point where there are entities out there that will call anything they do in wireless 5G because, number one, policymakers love it and, and think, here's this magic bullet in broadband that is going to solve all our problems. Um, and number two, the public has heard this term, and everybody wants 5G because, of course, you want the newest technology. We all want whatever the coolest and newest thing is. So I, um, I actually am pretty concerned that I think uh, decision making and policy making both in Washington and in the state capitals, hopefully not at the local level where we tend to be a little bit more pragmatic, I hope, but um, I think decision making is being driven to some degree by this you know, great wishful thinking that there is a magic bullet out there for broadband and that we're going to see this amazing wireless technology. And by the way, when policymakers hear wireless, they think cheap. And it is not cheap, to Josh's point, about all of that fiber, those massive amounts of fiber that will be needed to enable the speeds that the industry is postulating. The equipment will hopefully be capable of it. I mean, that will be very exciting. But it will need fiber deep, deep into the network, very, very close to the user. So it's going to be expensive, and it's not here yet. And the economics are not yet there. And we are all watching the trials and are very excited by them and hoping that this materializes. But I, I think that the hype has gotten ahead of the reality. And then the other thing I would say that I think local communities should be very aware of around separating hype and wishful thinking from reality is that it's important to know that because this is going to be an expensive new set of capabilities to deploy by the private sector, the private sector is going to do its best, but it's going to do what it's supposed to do under our system, and it's going to build where there is a return on investment. So it's important not to assume that the economics of this, because it is wireless, will lead to ubiquitous deployment throughout your communities. It probably won't, nor should we or could we require the private sector to do that. We can't expect them to build where they're going to lose money. But you should know that 5G is therefore not only not necessarily a magic bullet solution, but it potentially could exacerbate 
some divides, and there is therefore a role in filling those gaps for local and state government. Thanks, Joanne. Um, Angela, you've you've in your your role on the BDAC have probably spent more hours talking about um, costs and uh, things that can be done to reduce costs relative to these deployments than anybody in this room. Um, uh, maybe you have some insights about, you know, I guess I guess really two part question. One is um, th there's an assumption that um, the kind of services that are being comp uh, contemplated are 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 impactful enough to warrant, um, you know, changing the playing field relative to the, the fundamental costs of deploying these networks, and you know, what's what's your view of those impacts? And then, secondly, what are some of the things that um, different different levels of government can can or should do to try and help control some of those costs? Sure, I think I'll start with the first one, and I kind of echo you, Joanne. It's a great conversation that we're having here and, and a lot more frank than some of the ones I have participated in at the FCC. <laughs> um, that I can say for certain. I think when it comes to what you can do, um, I first would like to say I think, you know, we all do want the 5G services. We want what they bring. And from our particular area of business, I mean, we work with cities to build that infrastructure and help you broadband master plan so that you are prepared for the influx of services and big data and all those things that you can do to become a smart city. Um, I think where we get into the weeds on things and rulemaking and cost is we're trying to figure out how to deploy in a public right of way um, in a fair and balanced way for the carriers and for local governments. And um, the concerns that we've grappled with on the BDAC are trying to make sure that there are consistent, fair, published rates so that the carriers know what they need in terms of building that network, mm. but also on the local government side, protecting your, your rights of way. Um, I think one thing that's important to note is that there's so much more in that public right of way than just wireless, and I know that's near and dear to the carrier's heart, but you as a local government have to manage all those other aspects in the public right of way. And so if we start to begin to offer subsidies in one way um, to one carrier, um, we're almost looking like we're wanting to regulate like a utility, but not be regulated when it comes to the cost and the access. And so that's part of the equation. I think when you talk about rates and fees, you know, at the FCC, this has probably been one of the most controversial pieces of work, the Rates and Fees Committee, and they're still not completed. Um, we were able to pass a municipal model code through committee um, unanimously, and the only reason we were able to do that is because we left rates and fees blank, <laughs> <laughs> um, to be honest, and let the rates and fees committee go off to do their work. Um, I would encourage you to go out to the website because there's a pending final draft report that we'll take back up for consideration um, in our December meeting. And one of the gaps in that report is the committee gathered over 1,200 pieces of data across the country that were submitted, uh, pricing, you know, agreements throughout local governments um, with wireless carriers. And the whole goal of that committee was to analyze that data and come back with a set of recommendations that would help guide all of us, carriers, local government alike, on what is fair and balanced pricing, what makes this work well for both sides of the table. And unfortunately, the FCC stepped in at the 11th hour and said that data could not be used. There was some concern about non-disclosure. Um, there were a few of us that have some concerns about that challenge. Um, and so they were unable to make a recommendation on you know, how to manage those costs better. Um, on the flip side of that, there's still a lot of small cell legislation, not here, but around the country in about 20 states that are trying to dictate you know, what a cost looks like that's a um, you know, cost-based model versus a market-based fair pricing model. And, and I think that's the real debate at the table. Um, is trying to come up with something that works for both sides. I think San Jose is a model um, for what they developed um, in their community, and it got at the very thing we saw in the video, the digital inclusion. Uh, they were able to negotiate with folks like AT&T, a digital inclusion fund that will help them get to their un underserved communities and help expand their services more quickly. And I think that was hailed as a great agreement and a good model for us to work from. Great, thank you, that's very helpful. So while we're on the topic of the FCC, uh, uh, some of you may be aware that uh, the FCC has recently um, taken action on small cell siting matters, and I'd love to get a, a response in these early days um, from both uh, John and Joanne and, and see um, you know, how you view those changes and what, 
impacts you think that'll have on on both network deployment and and on the communities directly? Do you want to go first, Joanne? Be my guest. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think, um, you know, we were supportive of the FCC's action. I, I think um, one of the things that we like about it is it provides certainty to the industry, and, and that's an important, you know, a, a really important thing for us to understand. And, and it provides certainty also on the cost side, right? It caps what those fees can be um, for deployment of small cells in, in the municipal right of way when you're using municipal property. Um, so obviously this is going to be litigated. I think it's going to be at the 10th Circuit in Denver, I think, is where it's been consolidated. So. Um, there's, I, I don't know that the final chapter has been written on this by any stretch, but um, we think you know the FCC took the right approach with respect to, to trying to set up a, um, a set of rules that works for the industry's perspective, also works for the municipality's perspective. Um, and, I, and I think if you can have certainty that that can really help to drive investment, I think that's an important thing. Okay, thanks, John. And, and Joanne, I, I'd ask the corollary also, in, in addition to the, the first question is, given given that you know this will be the law of the land here in on January 1st and there'll be some period of uncertainty about the final answer I'm sure you're having to have some conversations with municipalities about what they should do in the meantime and so at, at the risk of asking you to give a bunch of free advice <laughs> on, that, on that consulting topic um, maybe you could also opine on that as well I, yes happy to do so um, and I'm happy to give this kind of free advice and by the way my thoughts on this will go up on my company blog later today um, I, I'll get to the order itself in a minute, but for those of you who are here from local governments, please take steps to protect yourselves because the preemption order that will become effective in January has, it, it is extraordinary in its breadth, breadth and its aggression in preempting state and local authority, um, and it has enormous implications for carrier use of your assets and your ability to control your own property. And there are steps that you can take in terms of planning, publishing standards, making sure that you have processes and plans and so on all in place, all of which can be entirely reasonable and should be reasonable and should be coordinated with the industry, all of which you can do, but that then put you in a position where you're able to assert your own interests and needs rather than having it imposed on you by the FCC, although frankly, some of it is being imposed on you regardless. Really briefly, I mean, I, I will say that the order troubles me in a number of ways. First of all, because I do think it is a gross violation of state and local authority by unelected bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. who don't understand what's happening in our local communities, and that is troubling in a whole bunch of ways. Second, it troubles me because the idea of preempting state and local authorities, stopping them from developing certain kinds of process around access to their own assets, and mandating that they have to price those assets at a certain level rather than at market, effectively a forced subsidy by state and local government of a handful of companies, courtesy of the unelected bureaucrats in Washington, D.C., that is um, premised in the order on the idea that if you make wireless companies more profitable in New York City and in Greenwich, they will then turn around and use their savings from that to go build new wireless facilities in rural Wyoming. That's effectively what the FCC says in the order. And by the way, I don't think there's a whole lot of economic basis for it, if any. Um, and we all know that the economics of that are ludicrous and incoherent. And um, Wall Street's pretty dubious about this. And two weeks ago, Verizon, on an earnings call, actually, when asked, is this going to change your deployment pattern, said, no, not really. We had everything we needed in place, not changing anything about what we're going to build. We, we, we need to be really concerned about this. And not just because all of what I just said is grossly unfair and, and subverts local authority, but because Rural broadband really matters, and it is a big smokescreen to suggest that somehow changing the pricing for access to public property in our metropolitan areas is going to result in new broadband deployment in our rural areas. It's not going to happen. The economics of that don't work. It's not now more profitable to build in Wyoming than it was yesterday when it was less profitable to build in New York. And and if this is what we are thinking is broadband policy making, then we are not developing real solutions for rural Wyoming or rural Connecticut or rural Massachusetts and so on. And I am incredibly troubled by that because these broadband issues deserve better. Finally, one last thought about why it bothers me is that when we think about broadband, 
local decision making and local creativity is so critical. What I spend my time on is public-private partnerships, and, and I think we have had enormous results around that. When the FCC takes tools out of all of your hands, including your own property, your ability to do what you want with your property, to try to incent private investment, to try to shape private investment, to make your market more attractive, when they take all those tools out of your hands, they make it that much harder for you to actually make a difference on the broadband front. So I think this order is deeply counterproductive to the things that we all care about and what it purports to care about, which is expansion of broadband. Okay, thanks, thanks, Joanna. It, it sounds like you know we have you know, two two competing public policy challenges here. Uh, one is how do we think about uh, broadband deployment in both rural and urban areas, and what are the funding sources there? And then also, how do we responsibly manage our right of way, uh, which are are now inextricably linked, uh, but also in and of themselves two separate and distinct challenges. Um, the FCC order and, and, of course, the whole framework of the controversy um, stems from the back pressure um, of uh, carriers needing and wanting to deploy these facilities and having challenges uh, in doing so. And so as we encounter, um, you know, fundamentally what's a, what's a controversy that includes elements that are common themes in our wireline network deployments. Um, I'm wondering if um, anyone on the panel has thoughts about how do we deal with adjudicating the, the wider uh, public policy challenge of broadband digital divide growing, um, and the more investment we make in urban and less in rural, that getting deeper, and also wanting to make sure that areas where networks are struggling from a capacity standpoint continue to meet, you know, basic needs in both urban and rural areas. Anybody have thoughts, thoughts on that? Um, I'll say one, here, here. Um, <laughs> we have very similar passions on this, and, and I think part of what we're experiencing right now um, is there is a lot of propaganda out there um, that is brought forward by the industry, and so I'll, I'll use my home state. I'm based out of Nashville, Tennessee, and over this past year, um, there was a small cell bill that was introduced and it went swimmingly through, passed. And one of the things that I was most upset and concerned about, not only because that's the business that I'm in, but I'm a resident and I'm watching this happen, was the lack of education and awareness that was out there across my state and across those communities to understand what this type of legislation, what this act that the FCC has now voted through what would actually do. And there was a grave misunderstanding that it was going to solve the digital divide and bring coverage to rural Tennesseans. There's about six million of them. Um, and that was the number that kept getting put forward when in fact there was nothing in the legislation, not a word that would ever require a carrier to build out in those areas. I think you have to move forward and I think one step the industry could take is to back off the 5G propaganda because that is what's propelling these discussions, this legislation into a place that becomes negative for local government and it actually stymies the ability to build out. I think that's the one thing about the FCC's ruling. It actually did more to slow the process down than it has to accelerate 5G anywhere, urban or rural, because now here we are debating a judicial lottery, where is it going to be heard? It'll probably be stayed as a result and it could take a year and a half to two years to work through this. Meanwhile, back at the Bat Cave, we're all trying to figure out how to get to those rural communities. And so for, for me, I think the first thing is you, everybody's got to come back to the negotiating table. You know, we built a successful wireless network across this country over the last 20 plus years. There's no reason to believe we can't continue to do that with small cells. It's a new, better element, a better way to do it. But I think everybody's got to be willing to acknowledge that and sit down at the table to work through it. John, do you have a response? Yeah, I mean, I just, I think first, um, my company's perspective, particularly with deployment in Connecticut, has been, has been that this has to be a collaborative process. Um, we've never believed that, you know, we should come in and dictate to a city or town where we go and put things. Um, we have a little bit of a, a bifurcated system for de uh, deployment of small cells. In Connecticut, if you're on a wooden utility pole, there are a certain set of rules versus being on municipal property. Um, 
and we were, you know, my company was one of the ones who pushed Pura to include in its rules, and, um, and I will give the OCC a lot of credit for supporting that proposal that came out as well, but to include in there that, you know, carriers have to collaborate and sit down and talk to municipalities about where we want to put small cells and make sure we get their input. Um, it, it certainly helps and speeds deployment ultimately if you're working together um, and you're not, you know, litigating. I don't think litigation is a, is a smart um, strategy to get anything deployed, certainly. I, I will say just on the on addressing the issue of digital divide, um, you know, we are doing not in Connecticut, um, but in in states, you know, far more rural states where we are the local carrier, um, we're using, you know, fixed 4G LTE to provide, um, provide uh, broadband service out to rural America. Um, and we've found that that's worked very well so far. So I do think wireless does play some, does have a role to play there. Um, and then I, I just talk about the, the sort of the propaganda on the 5G. Um, you know, there's, there is a lot of hype out there, I'll, I'll, I'll admit it, um, but it's coming, frankly, from a lot of different corners, right? So the, the equipment makers are, are as much behind it as anybody else, so um, it's a, it is a hard thing to control. Um, I do think, you know, I've tried to make clear when we go in and talk to communities about small cells, yeah, this, this is, a, is a foundational building block to 5G in the future, um, but it's really about fixing, um, fixing capacity needs that are there today and are on a short-term horizon. So um, it's about improving that customer experience. So. Great, thanks, John. I think we have a question uh, here from the audience. We do. Can you make the connections among 5G with regard to things such as maker cities, smart cities, IoT, uh, smart city infrastructure? You I, I, we probably all can, but I think to I think to a degree, yeah. Um, one of the things that 5G allows for, and again, um, I think there's a you know standards are not set, but they're pretty close to being there now. Um, one of the things it does allow for um, is for a lot of different connections into a into a node, and allows for a lot um, lower power usage for whatever that device is that's connected. Um, so that helps to solve the IoT one of the IoT uh, mysteries that you have today is how do you provide um, you know power to that IoT device? Um, so is 5G part and parcel and important um, to smart cities? Yeah, absolutely. It's an enabling technology. Um, there's a lot of smart city applications that are already out there. Um, we're, we've deployed them in a bunch of communities. Are looking at some here in Connecticut um, and are excited about it. Um, 5G is just kind of the next evolution of that and allows for I I'd argue a lot more. Um, a lot more devices and, and data to be um, collected and collated and used than, in, than today's network. But it, it's just think of it as kind of the next thing. It, but it is an enabling technology. Fair? Yeah, yeah I do agree with that. And I, I think, um, you know, the, what I would say is that 4G densification, or what Josh called uh, 4.5G, right, which is just a lot more placement of these small coverage areas, small cells on utility poles, light poles, et cetera, throughout our communities in order to use spectrum more efficiently and make our 4G networks work better and respond to all that enormous demand that John referred to. That is a really good thing. It is a great thing for consumers. The network will work better. We will get better services. It will respond to our needs more. And what's coming in 5G, which I think is a longer term prospect than most people are saying, but certainly the technologies are being developed and it's very exciting. We'll see how the economics materialize. All that is thrilling too and will allow for new uses of the network and what we call smart cities, which is still a very vague and still kind of a marketing term, right, and IoT, which is the same. But at the core of this, every community needs dense, dense infrastructure. And that means lots and lots of fiber, and then lots of next generation wireless overlaying that fiber. Gonna be a lot of fiber, though, to enable all of this. As an example, we analyzed this for San Francisco, and our analysis was that the speeds the industry is postulating will require fiber to three locations on every block, every block of the city of San Francisco. Now, not everywhere is quite as dense as that. It won't, won't necessarily require that kind of density of fiber everywhere, but it's gonna get pretty close. So to prepare your community to be the smart city of the future, and that could mean lots of different things, and that will change over time, become a lot more clear over time, you wanna be sure you have that density of infrastructure. Working with the industry is the exact right way to do it, and I'm always happy when the industry is willing to work with us. I actually think it's an absolute priority, but I honestly would prefer if Washington get, didn't get involved, because I think we do it better at the local level. So I have, a, I have a brief anecdote, and John's going to chime in, and then we're going to take another uh, question from the audience. So uh, Joanne mentioned the idea of three uh, nodes per block, and, and, and just anecdotally, um, I've got a 
pretty small company in the scheme of companies that do that. We have about 450 employees. We'll deploy about 10,000 road miles of fiber this year in the service of, um, of coming for more 4.5 and, and, and 5G. And fundamentally, those locations that have fiber in a 4G node uh, will be the first to get a, a 5G node. So in terms of being, being fast to have that infrastructure in place is an important part of being on the roadmap to 5G. Go ahead, John. Yeah. I, the, the one thing I just want to, um, we keep throwing around small cells. I want to make sure people understand what that is, right? Because we all know what big cells are, big macro cells that are on monopoles. So small cells, you know, and I'll use my company specs. The, it's really three pieces of equipment. The first equipment is the antenna. That's anywhere from, it's usually in our case, about 25 inches tall by about 10 inches wide. Um, and then two radio units that are eight by eight. Um, and maybe a electric meter, depending on what the deployment is and what the relationship is with the electric company that's there. Um, that's the extent of the equipment that we're talking about. It is very, very different than a macro site or a rooftop site or something else that you're used to seeing that we see in so many places. And you can do a lot to stealth it as well, too, if you do a good job of it. So. We're, we're can take, I follow up we, with a question? We're going to take this audience question first, okay. and then we'll come, we'll come back to the panel. So the question was, uh, Joanne, you talked about the fact that cities should be preparing now uh, for the implementation of the FCC order, and the question was, what should they be doing? Okay, um, thanks. So um, I would start by saying, make sure your attorneys review your existing policies, practices, and standards to make sure that you are aligned with the FCC order. Um, and work on them if not, and then take technical steps in terms of technical planning to protect yourselves going forward. A lot, so I can't speak to the legal side of the order, but as I read it, a lot of the practical impact effectively says that you have to have reasonable standards in place, and they have to be available, they have to be fairly available to everyone, they have to be non-discriminatory, and they have to be published. So you want to be sure that you have those kinds of standards, and that'll be everything from standards as to what the equipment can look like, where it can go, where it can be placed, if there are aesthetic requirements, like if it has to be painted to match uh, like a historic um, light pole that it might be placed on, full range of different kinds of technical considerations. You don't want to leave ambiguity out there about that because that would be considered unreasonable. You want to have reasonable standards. Um, related to, and by the way, there'll be a lot more detail in that blog I mentioned. Um, I, I, I would go on for a long time here if I could, but the other thing that I would really encourage you to think about um, as you think about this is, the order is so expansive that we are concerned that it will take control out of your hands with regard to whether your assets can even be used. You may not, under certain circumstances, even be able to say, sorry, but you can't use my light poles. And you have to plan and prepare for that now as well. So we are recommending, because every one of these assets, by the way, has a primary purpose, right? It wasn't made to place a small cell on. It was, it was created in order to provide light or to provide traffic lights, et cetera, um, to hold utility attachments and so on. We are recommending that you have a strategy and a plan in place that addresses what are the needs for many of these assets for public safety and for other government users so that you are able to reserve some of these assets for your own needs down the road, particularly in denser metropolitan areas, there could be demand for all of your assets. In the cities, we are without question going to see that. And if that is the case, and because I, and I think the equipment's a little bit bigger in my experience than John's description just because it comes with some really big cabinets and the equipment touches every part of a pole in most circumstances. There's not room for multiple attachments on a pole, for example, and what that means is that if it is utilized by a carrier, you may not be able to use it for a public safety wireless need down the road. And so planning in order to reasonably reserve what you need for your own purposes would be um, something that we would advise doing. And I'm sorry, one last further thought on the size of small cell equipment. I know it's called a small cell, but that refers to the coverage area. Um, and John, I hear what you're saying about the antenna and the size and so on, but my understanding is that AT&T has asked state legislatures for um, standards, and the FCC, by the way, also this was what it built into the order, is that a small cell is designed as, or is defined as an antenna and related equipment of no more than three cubic feet, and then an 
ancillary um, equipment on that pole as no more than 28 cubic feet. That's a very, very large amount. Um, but are you saying that at and is not deploying those kinds of cabinets? I, I, I think the, what you're talking about is in a case, i uh, use Boston as an example where we've done some deployments um, using um, ornamental street lights. We have built and we've taken the equipment so you don't have the radio units that are sitting uh, you know, mounted on the pole. In some cases, we've included them in the base at the bottom of, of the facility because that's what the city wanted. That's my guess as to why that, that number is different than what we're talking about. I, the, the numbers I quoted before are things I know we have an application sitting with an agency at the moment right now, and I've seen those, seen those numbers before. That's the reason why I quoted that. But I think the reason why that number is larger because it's trying to also care for the case where you know, at the case of a, in, at the request of municipality, we've tried to, you know, stealth all of those um, components at the bottom of the shroud of, uh, of the light pole. Okay, just for what it's worth, you should all know that the pending FCC order would allow the 28 cubic feet on your, um, um, on your asset, and it's just worth thinking about as you think about what the potential implications are going forward, because that's pretty robust. And I am, I mean, I've spent my entire adult life advocating for more and better broadband and for public-private partnerships, but I, I am concerned that we have some clashes coming that, to your point, will get in the way of deployment rather than facilitating and enabling. Well, and if I could weigh in on that, because the, the whole size and the 28 cubic feet, and we've seen up to six cubic feet on the other side of that, um, these are all themes that have been in the legislation that have passed in the 20 states that have it. And so it's, it's not surprising at all that it showed up in the order from the FCC, because with the exception of deemed granted in the shot clock clause, that was the only change that was actually in the favor of local government versus what we've seen across the board in small cell legislation. And that's really what's led to the demise of the bills in some areas. You know, California fought off 649 last year successfully because they actually illustrated the cubic feet allowance that what it would look like. And it was the size of a refrigerator that a, an average male could stand inside the box. There's a great picture of it. Um, it's actually out on our website if, if you want to look at it. And I think that's where the confusion starts, is you see this over here, and you could actually somewhat live with it, right? It's certainly bigger than a pizza box. It's bigger than a backpack. I've heard all those things. But it has to have supporting castmates with it. There's ground-mounted equipment considerations. And I wish that everyone were as friendly as you are here in the state of Connecticut with working with size requirements and, like, Boston, a best practice that has you know, been hailed all over the country. But the reality of it is, when it gets dispersed across the country, that becomes less and less the case, and you're ending up with an ugly looking pole with a lot of attachments competing with one another. The other part of what we've seen in the small cell legislation is the height of the antenna is another issue. It can go 10 feet higher than your highest exi existing antenna. So there are all kinds of other considerations than just looking at it as a small cell going somewhere. And I, for one, think there are a lot of best practices out there. It sounds like there are some here in Connecticut, too. And those are the things that we should be focusing on and working together um, to promote. And that's one of the things those of us that represent municipal interest on the FCC committee have really had concerns about all along. It's why some of our members have resigned over time, because it is so important to focus on those cities that have great ideas that could be, you know, flourishing around the country versus litigating it where we're seeing those type of size requirements become an issue. Yeah, just, just one comment on size requirements and then we're gonna take another question uh, from the audience. So um, in a recent pilot project uh, that we built, we, had the, we were in the unusual situation of putting a 4G and a 5G node on the same pole. And so our experience uh, in that project was that the 4G node and all the ancillary equipment, when we say ancillary equipment, a small cell site, has some different components. It has an antenna, it has some radios, um, it has some power supply things like a, uh, a meter, a disconnect, some circuit breakers. There's some ancillary equipment. And so the aggregate of all that ancillary equipment in the radios was roughly the size of that mini fridge. That was a 4G node. Now it didn't look like that mini fridge. It was sort of taller than it was wide uh, to match the pole. But And then it had a big antenna on the top, a can antenna. Uh, sort of in the dimensions that, that John had described before. We also put a 5G node on that location, which interestingly did share the power infrastructure, so it came off of the same meter, um, but it didn't have, doesn't come with any other ancillary equipment. It's all kind of in, in one neat little case, and the 5G node was much smaller. So when I say much smaller, I mean it was about this big. It was about 
this wide, just to kind of give you a sense. And I watched an installer put it up with one hand. It was very light. Um, and so one of the challenges that we face is, is that we are, we are still in a 4G world. Uh, and so for our 4G phones to work well, they still need some of this bigger equipment. Um, uh, the 5G equipment is much smaller, but the 5G equipment uh, generally operates at a shorter range, and we require more of it. So I think the challenge that we're facing moving forward is less about big, beefy structures um, that can hold the weight uh, of some larger equipment, um, but the more ubiquity of these smaller devices. And so the, the hype of the smaller devices came a little early. I said, wait a minute, it's not the size of a pizza box, it's the size of a refrigerator. But we're actually achieving some of the form factors, I think, that were promised several years ago are now more the reality of the emerging 5G technology. Um, but they require many more co-locations. And so I think sort of the energy behind these sort of land use questions um, of what do we do from a responsible management standpoint is the fact that there will be many, many more of these. Um, and uh, so I think it's important to remember we're not talking about just size, but we're talking about distribution. Deb, did you have a, another question from the audience? So who has done the independent comprehensive health risk assessments and where are those studies available for review? Who'd like to speak to that? I can give a, I can give a broad question, a broad answer to that. I mean, the FCC has very stringent rules on, on what RF output um, you can get from, from devices, from macro sites and from small sites. Um, and the RF output out of small cells is very, 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 very low. Um, but it's all FCC rules that the industry has to follow. Is that a fair way of putting it? I, I, might, I might just chime in with a, with, a, with a little bit more information relative to, to the RF power levels of these devices. So um, one of the things that uh, small cells brought to us was that they were closer to people than tower sites. So that sort of reinvigorated the conversation about the threats to public health. I'm not a public health guy or a physician. Um, so I'll, I'll give you my view as a, as a recovering RF engineer. Um, and uh, one of the things that um, that RF um, RF exposure keys on is proximity and power, and so proximity pretty important. Power is pretty important. Um, well, we know we're closer to people, um, and so one of the bad trajectories I saw early in small cell deployment was initially when small cells were deployed, they were fairly low power, and and they yielded an unsatisfying result, and so the power levels of the devices started to creep up. Um, you know, initially they were five watt deployments and, and before you knew it, they were 90 watt deployments. Um, 90 watts, not, not that much power if you're far enough away from it. If you're close, really close to it, it can be challenging. Um, and when, by really close, I mean like within a foot or two. Um, what I'm finding in current deployments that we're seeing that are coming into the pipeline in our company is that the power levels have gotten much, much lower and the proximity has stayed the same as the 4G deployment. So as 5G nodes are coming out and even 4.5G nodes, we're seeing 2 watt, 3 watt, 5 watt, 1 watt kind of units. And so the power levels have come way down. So without regard to what that means for public safety or public health, which I'm not an expert, I would say there was a, a bit of a worrisome trend for a minute. And that trend has now shifted where proximity has stayed the same and power levels have come down. And <clears throat> I'll add to that, there are FCC rules. They are old and there's a lot more RF around us all the time than there was even six months ago and there's going to be a lot more six months from now but certainly a lot more than there was 10 years ago the density of devices and you know the range of spectrum bands that are being utilized and so on all to the best for us as consumers and for cities from a policy standpoint this is all good news but it there are this is an issue that's out there and consumers will keep asking it. So I wish the FCC would re-engage this issue and lay it to rest. It is entirely possible it would be laid to rest that there are not issues here, but there's enough uncertainty and the FCC rules are old enough and there's enough data coming from outside the United States that a lot of people are very confused. I will say for those of you who come from utilities, one thing that you should be very aware of is that your line workers, if they are on utility poles, um, will be in very close proximity 
to a lot of small cells in a way that they haven't been in a pre-small cell era. And that kind of proximity, to Josh's point, is something you should be concerned about. And as you build those technical standards I was talking about, make sure that that is one of them, that if you've got line workers on the poles, you have a means of shut off of that, those small cells because you've got significant um, issues relevant to your workers related to that. Yeah, and all of, all of our agreements include things like that for that reason. Right. Uh, I think what we're finding is that um, so far all of the small cells that we've deployed have had a disconnect at ground level, um, and generally there's an operating relationship between the carrier and the lineman to turn off those devices before they they go up. Um, you know, relative to the larger conversation about whether or not the FCC um, should reopen the book on how they view the standard, would it be fair to say, and this is a question for anybody who's interested in responding, would it be fair to say that because the FCC standard is established, the, um, the safety of that RF, if it's within the FCC standard, is not a point of leverage uh, relative to the communities um, that may be seeking to approve or disapprove the small cell sites? Yes. So is that a, everybody? OK. Uh, other other questions from the audience? Hi, <clears throat> Drew Clark, Broadband Breakfast. I'd love all of your thoughts on the way more fiber to the home deployments may, I'm not sure the word, you know, obviously be a collaborative force with 5G deployments, perhaps also take take the, the load off the cost of deploying 5G. Uh, could you just speak to collaborations that you are seeing or aren't seeing between people who want to do FTTH develop deployments and those entities that are looking to have more 5G towers out there? Thanks, Drew. John, did you Yeah, I mean, there's, and, and, and sorry, one more point. Also throw in the, the point about the backlash we're seeing to 5G deployment <clears throat> and how that could be a stimulus for fiber deployments. Um, let me just your first part first. Um, I think um, there's definitely a flywheel effect, right? Um, as you, I think um, both the other two panelists talked about how much these networks, these small cell networks, um, need fiber. Um, so at and is in the process of deploying fiber to some 13 million homes across the country right now. Um, that is going to help spur the 5G deployment. Um, you're doing fiber runs. It's pretty simple to put up a couple of extra strands and make those available for, uh, for 5G as well. So I think there's definitely some synergy that, that occurs and that helps the, helps the industry. You do one truck roll, you put up one line of fiber, it makes it much simpler to do, um, certainly. And then um, I don't frankly feel like there's been a backlash on the 5G, so maybe, maybe that's coming. Um, I will tell you, um, just wireless from a broad perspective, I've been at this company now for um, 17, 18 years. Um, there are parts in Connecticut where um, 10 years ago, if I went and suggested building a tower in a community, they would burn me in effigy. Um, and now I get the same towns who 10 years ago wanted to kill me now say, will you come here and build a tower, please? I think the, I think the, the paradigm has shifted um, very much from a, to a wireless world. People want that wireless connectivity. So I don't necessarily see, expect a, some sort of backlash on 5G, to be, to be frank with you. Does that, does that answer your question? Is that fair? Yeah, Angela, do you have some thoughts on that? I was just going to agree. I, I don't think you're going to see a backlash. I, I think there's pent-up demand for the services, and there is a lot of excitement with what 5G can bring. Um, I just think there's a lot of misunderstanding on when it's actually going to be here and what it will actually be to every person across the country. Your experiences are going to vary depending on where you are. So I don't anticipate backlash as much as there's pent-up demand, and so I think there's a lot of misunderstanding more than anything else. Yeah, there's not going to be a light switch that we throw that turns yeah. on 5G to everybody. Um, I, I guess I would I would just add that uh, relative to fiber densification, Drew, one of the challenges we run into is the uh, as the fruit gets higher on the tree on where there's a economic argument to be made for the deployment of fiber in the service of any type of user is that it often takes the aggregation of many types of users to pay the freight um, on that fiber. And we're involved in several network builds right now where the fiber owner contemplates that fiber being used. Um, by one or more cellular carriers, by business users, and by home users. And so where we're mostly seeing 5G interplay to sort of tie this back to, you know, how does 5G and, and fiber work is that we're seeing fiber developers and carriers make their business case on the assumption 
about 5G nodal density and the amount of fiber it will consume, and then also assume that they're going to pick up homes and businesses along the way and take an all of the above customer approach. Uh, what I'm also seeing is that those uh, 5G operators are viewing that 5G, I'm not even gonna call it a last mile, I'll call it a last few feet, if they can get fiber very close to your home, um, that they're viewing that uh, 5G node as a drop replacement, not even a lateral or a last mile replacement, but simply a drop replacement to avoid the very high cost of perhaps directionally boring under a street and under a lawn and messing up your irrigation system um, when they're coming into the home. And so um, then the question comes up is, you know, are, is that as good a service? And um, I think if, if any of those manufacturers are in the room or, or the carrier selling the service, they would say yes. Uh, my, my personal observation has been um, that it works very well, a gig or more. Um, but, you know, we'll see when obviously networks are oversubscribed and working in all kinds of field conditions is a, is a different story. But um, generally, I think fiber carriers are starting to view small cells uh, for whatever reason, whether they're for 5G or 4G densification, as a way to underwrite the extension of their networks into areas where they might not have had a business case to serve those customers by themselves. So over here, we're going to do one last question, if you don't mind, Josh. Um, this is a, a repeat of the question just asked and one more. Um, Joanne, in your study in San Francisco, you came to $5,000 a home passed and connected to put a fiber network in the, in the city as a whole. Uh, we could do the entire region in northwest Connecticut for about $4,500 a home, leaving out the big cities and $2,500 a home um, uh, putting the big cities in. And I'm wondering if in places like San Francisco where everything's underground and the poles have to be constructed anew if you're going to put cells on them and attached to an underground network, that in fact in many urban areas there's more expense than rural areas for 5G. And does that not drive ultimately a necessary cooperation between public and private where the public actually is an owner of some portion of the network uh, rather than just an investor in the network? And the second question has to do with um, net neutrality, I'm not net neutrality, but host neutrality. How do you see, um, are we gonna have host neutral antennas or are we, everybody, the four pliers are gonna actually put their own antennas up? How's that gonna go? So Joanne, lot, lots there, we have two minutes remaining. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> I hope I'm, I'm answering your question because there, there was a lot there. I, I will just say the economics of fiber to the home are really, really tough. Frankly, the economics of 5G, if, if it emerges the way we are hoping and has the capacity and the, the deep fiber that it needs and the short wireless pieces, in, as in Josh's illustration, those are also really tough. It, it is just hard to make this work. That is why we are all in the room because broadband is hard to the economics are difficult. There potentially, where there are gaps, there is a role for a city or a county or a town or a state on the infrastructure side. There are lots of different roles, but this is one role that is a logical one and that was part of the insight of the city of San Francisco. Should we be investing in the infrastructure as a long-term, 100-year asset, conduit fiber, et cetera, that makes the city future-proof and allowing the private sector then build, operate, maintain um, a, a network. If that's what I'm, if I'm answering your question, yes, I think that potentially shifts the economics of what that looks like. It, it may be more viable, frankly, and more attractive from a market standpoint for the private sector in smaller towns and cities than in San Francisco. Um, for a variety of reasons having to do with less competition, uh, more unmet demand, and so on. But I think there is an insight there where infrastructure can potentially be a contribution that the public sector brings to the table in order to enable this to the point of this enormous depth of fiber that we really need in every community and that we've got a long way to go. Great. Thanks, uh, Joanne. And that'll be our last word. I want to thank the panelists. Um, for a, a respectful and, and focused and candid conversation and to the audience for just the wonderful questions. Mm -hmm.